It is a joy and a privilege and an honor to be with you folks today here at Coggins. I am so thankful that Brother Scott and I were finally able to get a date together. It isn't that he hadn't tried. I've just been super busy, and every time he'd call, I would be already booked. But he did this from several weeks ahead of time, and so he gave me the opportunity to be with you. And I, I always enjoy coming here and being with you and seeing friends that we made while we were here over the years. Uh, I want you to turn this morning to Genesis chapter number 22 in your Bibles, if you will, if you have one. And uh, we're going to look at an Old Testament look at Calvary this morning. But before I get into the message, I wanted to tell it, to give you a little um, advice, I guess. Sometimes, you all ever jump to conclusions about anything? Uh, I have a time or two. Jumping to conclusions can be a very dangerous thing if you're not careful. And uh, I heard a great story about a new CEO that had come into this company and he had made him CEO and he was one of these guys that he had enough brass to make his own horn and enough wind to toot it uh, in one of those things. And, and I'm gonna set this somewhere, let me set it right there. But anyway, he, uh, he came into the uh, meeting, uh, to the place and he wrote a letter to all of the employees. He said, on a certain date, I want everybody in the main, t uh, over in the main lobby and there'll be a seat for everyone. I want you seated when I come in. I'm gonna pre talk to you this morning, that morning about your job and about your uh, future with this company. I expect full cooperation, no excuses. Everybody be here and be seated when I walk in. Well, the day came and folks had gathered in and everybody was seated except one guy. He was up uh, against a wall leaning against a, a post. And so as, he, uh, as the CEO marched in, he marched up through the crowd and he got up to the platform and he looked around. He saw that guy. He said, hey, said, uh, oh, well, did you not get the, the uh, memo that I said everyone's to be seated in this place? He said, how much money do you make around here anyway? And he said, well, I, I make about $400 a week. He said, I'll be back. He stomped off the platform, went back to his office, got 16 $100 bills, walked back out, called him up front, said, here, and he counted out $1,600. He said, that's four weeks severance pay. Don't you ever come back in this place again. Now, you did not follow my orders. You're fired. Get out of here. So he left. As he went out the door, the CEO reared back and said, now, can somebody tell me what that clown did around here? One guy raised his hand and said, he's the Domino Pizza Man. He brought our lunch. <laughs> Don't jump to conclusions. It could, it could get on you. This morning I'm looking at Genesis 22, and this is a mountain peak in the Old Testament. This chapter, in chapter 22 of the book of Genesis, is of tremendous importance. I'm sure you've heard it before preached on, and uh, this morning is no different, but I, I have some thoughts that I want to share with you on it. So I'm going to begin reading uh, with verse number one, and it says, And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham, and said unto him, Abram, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here am I. And he said, take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and clave wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto the young men, Abide ye here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again unto you. And Abraham took wood, took the wood of the burnt offering, laid it upon Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood. But where's the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a, burnt off, for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. And they came to the place which God had told him of. And Abram built an altar there and laid the wood in order, bound Isaac his son and laid him upon the altar of, wood, of the wood. Abraham stretched forth his hand, took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called out of heaven 
and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I. And he said, lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to this day in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. It was 11.30 in the morning on May 29th, 1953, that Sir Edmund Tillery hoisted the British flag on the top of Mount Everest. It was the first time that any man had ever stood on the top of this great mountain. He had climbed to the very top and he had conquered Mount Everest. He literally climbed to the top of the world as far as the world was concerned that particular day. And as he scaled Mount Everest, he faced a lot of problems. He faced discouragement. He faced danger. He faced disaster. He faced death as he made his way up the face of that mountainside. There were huge boulders that would roll down and could have killed him. Deep walls of ice and crevices all around him. His limbs were aching and his supplies were running low. His spirit sometimes had been jaded and, uh, but against the bitter cold, he pressed on and on to reach the top the, uh, until finally he stood where no man had ever stood before, 29,002 feet above sea level. Here in Genesis 22, we come to another mountain, another great mountain. And we're gonna see two mountaineers that are gonna climb this particular mountain and they're gonna go where no man has ever gone before also. Abraham and Isaac will climb higher spiritually than any two men have ever climbed in their lives. Abraham will climb the highest mountain of submission, being willing to put his son on the altar because God had told him so. Isaac will climb the highest mountain of submission because he is to be the sacrifice. He is to be the one that is sacrificed. You know the story. Abraham and Sarah had no children, and yet in their old age, God brought a child into their life. You remember what happened when God told Abraham and Sarah that they were gonna have a child? They laughed. They thought that was funny. Abraham was 100 years old. Sarah was in her 90s. And it looked like that there was an impossibility there. That could not possibly happen by the way of uh, physical life. It was over for them as far as having children were concerned. So when the baby was born, they were told to name him Isaac. And the word Isaac means laughter, means they laughed about it. And so now this story that comes before us is a basic story. We've heard it over and over again. And I want to speak to you about what it is to look at Calvary in the Old Testament. And, and because I believe Genesis 22, is that that's exactly what we see. Jesus said in John 8, 56, he said, Abraham rejoiced when he saw my day. Abraham rejoiced. Paul writes in Galatians chapter eight, uh, chapter three and verse number eight that Abraham saw Jesus in the Old Testament and he said, he said, in thee shall all nations be blessed. Isaac is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ as he died on Calvary that day. It's a portrait in the Old Testament. It's a, a prophecy, it's a, a type, a picture if you please of the Lord Jesus dying on Calvary's cross. I want you to see with me for just a moment or two the comparisons between Isaac and the Lord Jesus. Isaac's birth was prophesied. God told Abraham and Sarah they were gonna have a son. It was prophesied that Isaac would be born. In the Old Testament, the prophets wrote and said, I believe it was Isaiah said, behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Both births were prophesied from. The date of their birth was preset. According to Genesis 21, verses one and two, when it comes to Sarah, it says the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken at the set time. The baby was born exactly when God had said it would be born. And of Jesus, it is said that it was in the fullness of time that Mary delivered Jesus. So the babies came at the proper time. They were named before their birth. 
In the Old Testament, in Genesis 17 and verse 19, the Lord told Abraham, thou shalt call this baby's name Isaac. And over in, the, in Matthew chapter one and verse 21, the, the Holy Spirit told Mary and Joseph, thou shalt call his name Jesus. They both had heavenly names, if you please. They were both conceived by a miracle. And both were the only son of promise. Abraham had the promised son of Isaac and Mary bore Jesus, our savior, the promised son of God coming into this world. And they were both received back from the dead, if you please. Let me read you something out of Hebrews chapter 11, the great honor roll chapter. It says in, in verse 17 through 19, it says this, by faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, and from whence also he received him in a figure. You see, Isaac died figuratively. Jesus died literally. Jesus died on the cross literally. Now, having said all that, I want you to look with me at this look in the Old Testament of what I call a look at Calvary in the Old Testament. Then we see in the start of the verses, verses three, four, and nine, we see an interesting word that appears over and over again. And I'm even gonna show it to you in the New Testament as well. Here is the way of the cross being explained to us. And in verse number three, it says, they went, talking about Abraham and Isaac, they went unto the place of which God had told them. In verse four, it says that Abraham saw the place afar off. And in verse number nine, it says they came to the place. The place, the place. It's an important place. There'll be no more important place in Abraham's life than this place, the place he's taken Isaac to. And so it's interesting to see that. And, and do you know what the name of Moriah means? It literally means chosen of God. That it was chosen of God. By the way, when it comes to Calvary, this is not an incidental incident that took place in the Bible. Calvary was not incidental, it was not accidental, it's fundamental to our Christian faith. And neither was the displace of Isaac. It was not an incident, it was not accidental, it was fundamental by Almighty God that Isaac be taken to that place. God had one place that he wanted Isaac to be offered. One place, the place, he called it. And why was that? Why would that be that way? Because it is a type of the place that Jesus Christ would die a place called Calvary. And Mount Calvary was in God's mind from eternity past. God had it in mind that he would send his only begotten son into this world. His heart and mind was the fact that, that Jesus would go to that cross. That was the calling of God upon the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus willingly left the ivory palaces of glory to come to this world, to go to the place. Say, preacher, you're emphasizing that pretty heavily. Let me give you something here that'll help you. Over in Luke chapter 23, and in verse number 33, here's what it says. It says, when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, there they crucified him with the malefactors, one on the right hand and the others on the left. They came to the place, same word. They came to the place. This place is important. That place is the place of Calvary. Isaac was offered up on the Calvary of the Old Testament. Jesus will be offered up on the Calvary of the New Testament. This place was appointed by God. This place was chosen by God. This place was foreseen by God. And so the way of the cross is the way that Jesus walked and he walked in the way of the cross the whole time. He knew that he came into this world to seek and to save that which was lost. Now when he comes back the second time, he's coming to rule and reign, but he's coming, he came the first time to save the, the lost. And so I want you to know not only the way of the cross, but we see the woe of the cross. In verses four through five back in Genesis 21, uh, 22, it says that they, the third day they came, uh, Abraham lifted up his eyes, he saw the place, and Abraham said to the young men, abide you here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. He says, we're gonna come again to you. 
The young men went with Abraham and Isaac as far as they could go, but there was a point. There was a line of demarcation which they had to walk away from. They could not go with Abraham and Isaac where they were gonna go. So the young men stayed and the father and the son start up that rugged hill by themselves. They're going up to the place where the altar will be built. They're going up to the place where the sacrifice will be given. What does that speak of? Well, I believe it speaks of Gethsemane. And I go back into, into Mark chapter number 14, Mark 14. I've got it marked in my Bible, Mark 14. And verses 33 through 36. It says, he taketh with him, talking about Jesus there in Gethsemane. He taketh with him Peter and James and John and behold, began to uh, be sore amazed and to be he very heavy. And he said to him, my son, soul is exceeding sorrowful to death. Tarry you here and watch. And he went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible with thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. Here's the father and the son going alone up Calvary's hill. The father and Jesus are going up Calvary's hill, but they go up in the garden together. And the Lord Jesus prays and says, let it pass if you could. And then he says, no, no, not my will, thine be done. You let your will be done. I think all of this prefigures, all of what Isaac did prefigures what Jesus did at Calvary. And so can you imagine what must have been going through Isaac's mind back in Genesis 22? Can you imagine what, I, now Isaac's no dummy. He's, he's been with his father when he sacrificed before. He understands what it is to go and build an altar. He understands what it is to lay the wood out just right. He understands what it is to light the fire, take the knife, slay the, slay the offering. He understands all of that. And so Isaac begins to look around and he says to his daddy, where's the sacrifice? Where is the lamb? I, I see the fire and I see the wood. I see the knife, but where's the lamb? By the way, that's the first time your Bible mentions the word lamb is right there in Genesis 22. Genesis 22 is the first time the word lamb is used in the word of God. When you get to the New Testament and you go to the book of Matthew, there's no mention of a lamb. When you go to the book of Mark, there's no mention of a lamb. When you go to the book of Luke, there is no mention of a lamb. But when you come to the gospel of John, John, the forerunner of Christ. John, the one who would make his path straight. John is out preaching, doing his baptism by the River Jordan. And he sees Jesus come walking down to the baptism. And remember what John said? He looked at Jesus and said, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Jesus Christ is the Lamb of the Old Testament. He's the Lamb of the New Testament. Jesus is the Lamb. So the Father and Son go up to the other. And, and so... Isaac begins to ask his daddy about that. And I can almost see Abraham. I can almost picture that Abraham's chin must have begun to quiver. Tears probably filled his eyes. And he said, son, I don't understand it all, but God will provide a sacrifice. God will provide the sacrifice for us. And so Isaac looks in the face of his father, Abraham. And from that point on, Isaac asked no more questions to his daddy. He asked no more questions. He's in full submission to what's going to take place. Can you imagine what was going through Abraham's mind? Can you imagine what it was to Abraham? Here he is with Isaac, his son, the promised son. Here he is with the one that God had said he'd make a great nation. He would, he would outnumber the stars and the sand and all that stuff. Well, and, and, and now God's telling him to take him up on that hill and sacrifice him. To lose a child is the most uncommon feeling that any parent can feel. I have felt that myself. I know wherein I speak. And I say to you this morning that it is unnatural for us parents to bury our children. And if you've buried a child, you can understand that and you know what I'm talking about. Here's Abraham. What was going through his mind? He's gonna not only offer his son, He's got to take his life. He's got to plunge that knife into him and, and kill him right on that mountaintop. 
There must have been awful questions going through his mind. He must have had a, had a, a staggering amount of, of, of conviction to go on up. Can you feel the heartbeat of that man? Knowing every step, he was one step closer to losing the boy that he loved. One step closer to sacrificing him on top of that mountain. Place your hand on the bosom of Abraham and feel his heartbeat. As I believe that that's as close as you will get to how God felt when he saw Jesus go to the cross. When God's only son hung on the cross, and by the way, God could have called 10,000, could have sent 10,000 angels and got Jesus off that cross. Now, Jesus, could have, he could have made it another way, but he chose to let Jesus die on the cross for you and me. And so we see the woe of the cross. But there's a willingness here. Look at verse number six. Abraham took the wood to burn off and laid it on, upon his son. And, 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 and he goes up and, and, uh, and Isaac begins to ask the questions that we mentioned just a few minutes ago. Now, what does all this mean? Doubtless by this time, Isaac has figured it out. He understands what's going to happen. And he realizes now he is the sacrifice. He is the one that is going to die. I believe, and my mind runs in a different channel sometimes than others do. But I got thinking about this, and I really believe this. You know, Isaac could have probably overpowered his daddy at that time and probably ran faster, a whole lot faster than he could run. If Abraham was 100 years old, when Isaac was born, and he's a type of Christ dying on the cross, my mind tells me that he must have been around 33 years old because Jesus was 33 and a half years old when they crucified him. And, and can you imagine this 33 year old young man there with a dad that's 133 years old? Why, he could outrun him just as easy as anything. We have two precious grandsons, one precious granddaughter I love her with all my heart. She's 16, got her license, and she's going on 25. But we still got two little boys. We got one that'll be 13 in September and one that'll be 11 in December. And those two little boys, they, they, they come to our house and they want to stay. They'll spend the night. And they'll even get me say, call mama and see if we can stay a few extra days. Boy, those are the days. We know that that'll end soon too with them. But we realized that. And so the other day we were out in the backyard and, and Buzz decided he wanted to play some football. He wanted to play some touch football. Come on, granddaddy, let's play some football. And I was dumb enough to go out there and take up a ball with him. And, uh, and uh, when I threw it with it, I could not catch him. But boy, they could nail me every time I got a hold of it. I, at 75, I couldn't, I had no chance of standing there and outrunning those boys. So Abraham had no chance if Isaac had wanted to rebel and run away, he could have. I want you to see the willingness of the cross. He, he, Jesus said this about when he died on the cross. Here's what he said. He said, no man takes my life from it. I lay it down of myself. Jesus bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Jesus was willing to die. He could have called 10,000 angels, but he didn't. I'm so glad the Bible says that Abraham and Isaac went together because it speaks of the willingness of the cross. They were willing to go. Jesus was willing to go. But now, I want you to see the weight of the cross. Verse six has a, a, a little thing in it that we overlook sometime. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, laid it upon Isaac, his son. The weight of the cross. Wood in the Bible is symbolic of, the, of humanity. In fact, if you go to the book of Psalms, in the very first book of Psalm, first, uh, Psalm, it says a righteous man is like a tree planted by the rivers of water. And I believe that the laying on of the wood on Isaac was symbolic of the laying of humanity on Jesus Christ, laying it on him. You see, he left all the gold and the glory and took on himself the wood of our wickedness. And the Bible says the Lord had laid on him the iniquity of us all. God put our sins on Jesus Christ. It was not anything he did, but it was what we did that put him on the cross. I believe that Jesus on that cross, when he put it on his back and he drug it up Mount Calvary. Of course, we know he stumbled and they called one Simon of Serene to help him carry it up the hill. But they laid the cross down and they, they went and they took him and laid him on that cross. Isaac went up with the wood on his back. It was foreseen of God. It was chosen of God. It was foreordained of God that this would happen. 
And so we see the weight of the cross. But what about the work that was done on the cross? I'm not going to take time to reread it, but verses 9 through 10, there were three things that Abraham has with him. There's a cord. Now we know that by inference because he bound Isaac. There had to be a cord. There was a cord. There was wood that was laid on his back. And there's a knife that will sacrifice him. What was the cord for? The cord was for the binding of Isaac. And what was the wood knife for? It was for the bleeding to kill him. And what was the wood for? It was for the burning of the sacrifice. The blinding, binding, bleeding, burning power of sin. Think about this. How awful the penalty of sin is. How horrible sin is when it comes to payment for sin. And the price that must be paid. Sin has a binding power. What, you, what people think will never get them, that's what really ties them up from time to time. It, it's the binding power that's there. It, 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 they, they, bound, it, it, they bind him up. And the bleeding. Now, I don't know about you, but blood is precious. Blood's a precious thing. The blood you have flowing through your veins right now, that life of the flesh is in the blood. Too bad that we didn't learn that early on in this nation. Because from what I understand from history, they, they would bleed people when trying to get the diseases out of them. What they were doing was taking the life out of them when they'd bleed them. And, and, and the life of the flesh is in the blood. Oh, the blood, the blood is special. I have a dear friend that's going through cancer. And he, I talked with him just the other day and he was so weak. He said, I, I'm going in to, to get my uh, infusion and, and I'll, I'll get, they're probably going to give me some blood too. I called him a couple of days later and he sounded like a new man. And I said, well, how are you feeling? He said, man, I feel like I could run a, a marathon. I said, really? I said, what'd they do? He said, I got two pints of blood and I think it must've been athletic blood because I'm ready to go somewhere, do something. Well, I tell you, he was excited. Blood gives us our life flow. Jesus' blood would be yet on that cross. Life was for bleeding. The blood, the burning, the, the wood, the awful penalty of sin, the burning power of sin. Jesus upon that cross was bound. They laid him on the cross and they took those nails and they nailed him to those pieces of wood and he bled for you and me. And Jesus literally was, being, was, was bound to the cross by the, by the nails. He's bleeding from the wounds and the burning power of our sins was working on him. He was under the, under the that, that was what he wanted to pass. It wasn't so much death as he wanted the sin. Jesus had no sin of his own, but he took all of our sin. And God's so holy, he can't look upon sin. That's why he turned his back on his son on the cross. He couldn't bear to look at what was going on. What is the work of the cross? This is the work of the cross. He who knew no sin, God hath made sin for us. God made Jesus sin for you and I. The work of the cross. Jesus died for our sin. Now, let me give you one last thing. And then I'll get you to the, I, I hope I can get you to the restaurants before they, uh, the, the, the Lutherans get there. Let's put it that way. You get the good salad. What's left? Let me give you the word of the cross. What is the word of the cross? I'll tell you in a moment. But first, I want you to see Abraham with his arm raised. I want you to see him poised with that knife in his hand. Isaac is laying before him. He is ready to plunge that knife into his son. And an angel says, Abraham, Abraham. Here am I. You don't have to do that, Abraham. Now I know. You, you, you trust God. And so he doesn't plunge the knife into his son. What did God want? Did God want the blood of little Isaac? No. He wanted the heart of Abraham. He wanted Abraham's heart on that altar. Why, why did the knife not plunge into Isaac? Because one day it would plunge into Jesus. This was where the story takes a different turn. Up to this point, Isaac can be looked at as a type, an illustration. But now God does something strange and something wonderful. Abraham looks behind him. And there, there he looks behind him. Verse 13. Abraham lift up his eyes and looked and behold behind him a ram caught in a thicket. And that's where we usually stop. 
There's a ram caught in the thicket. We, we can picture the thicket of, uh, of thorns, but read the next three words. He was caught by his horns. He's caught with the thorns around his head. Sound familiar? They put a crown of thorns on Jesus, didn't they? They nailed him to a cross. The thorns are around that, that, that uh, animal. And so Abraham sees it, that, that, and he takes that, uh, that uh, ram and he puts him to death. What is the word of the cross? What is it that made the word of the cross special? It's over in chapter, in verse 14. It says that Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh. That is to say to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. Jehovah Jireh. God will provide. Abraham calls Mount Moriah, the Lord will provide. The gospel had been preached to, G to Abraham through the Old Testament. And he saw Jesus and Jesus said, Abraham saw my day and he was glad because he saw that Abraham would be provided a sacrifice. What did God provide for you and me? A sacrifice. He provided Jesus Christ for us. He is the lamb. That's the reason that I say that Genesis 22 is an Old Testament look at Jesus Christ on the cross. For God so loved this world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him shouldn't perish but have everlasting life. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus as your personal savior, there is no better time, there's no better place to get right with the Lord than right here this morning. Oh, you don't have to come down and tell me anything but you need to talk to God about it. You can get saved in your pew or you can get saved bound in the altar. But I would encourage you before you walk out that door to make it right with the Lord and know without a shadow of a doubt that you're ready to meet Him. We don't know the day or the hour that we're going to meet the Lord. We have no clue when we're going to meet the Lord. This precious couple on the front row sat down beside of me this morning, two boys and a little girl. There were two boys in my family and we had a little sister. I was 10 years older than her and my brother was 14 years older than her. And two weeks ago, I stood beside her and she took her last breath. Cancer took her. She was just 65. You say, preacher, well, that's a pretty good age. Well, not if you're 75, that's young. But I want to tell you something. We don't know when we're going to leave this world but you will leave it one day. Are you ready? That's the case. Let's stand all over the house. I'm gonna ask our brother to come with a song of devotion to Christ. I believe it's turn your eyes upon Jesus. If there's anyone needs to make a move, you come on. Brother Tony Wilson will give the benediction at the end of the song. I'm here to help you if you need it. Thank you so much for listening this morning. Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to our latest video. Go ahead and click that little thumb so you can like that video, as well as on the bottom right hand corner, click that little bell to subscribe and receive notifications. Thank you again so much for tuning in, supporting our video ministry here at Cognitive Church.